Hello, welcome back. Um, I now want to dive a little bit deeper into um, our first nonlinear behavior, and that's the behavior of a limit cycle. Um, I want to give you a concrete example of this and show you how those um, differential equations that we saw before could be put into our standard form of x dot is f of x uh, u, y is g of x u, um, and also explain why no linear system can produce limit cycles, why this is something fundamentally nonlinear, uh, to hopefully give a, a bit more uh, motivation and encouragement for um, pursuing and sticking with uh, the course. So uh, the system I want to tell you about today is just a very simple mass spring damper system. So we have a spring, we have a damper, uh, we have a mass, there's maybe some external force being applied to the mass here f, and also we've got a position coordinate q, which is sort of measured from some nominal uh, uh, resting point of the mass, say. So the mass has just got mass m. We're going to have a normal um, Hookean spring with a stiffness k, but we're going to have a kind of a weird uh, damper. So our damper, its damping coefficient is going to depend on the value of q, and in particular, the relationship is going to be given by mu q squared minus 1. So we have this weird nonlinear damper. We're not going to worry um, if such a thing is even realistic. Um, this is more just a kind of a mathematical exercise. Maybe you could imagine putting some power source in a damper and do all sorts of complicated things to make it have this relationship. This is more just to illustrate the phenomena of a limit cycle um, and a first nonlinear system. It is important to know that you can build these types of systems. Um, they're more commonly built in the electrical domain. And indeed, this is where this particular limit cycle oscillator was uh, discovered. It was discovered by a guy called Van der Poel when he was messing around with some electrical circuits. So it, it might be hard to build um, such a nonlinear uh, uh, damper, but building equivalent um, electrical components um, is much easier and is indeed where this uh, system was first discovered. Um, so this is our system. It's not a course about modeling, so we don't need to worry about where our models come from necessarily. Um, but this is so simple that we can uh, probably drive it for ourselves. So. Um, let's apply Newton's law to the mass, and this tells us that the acceleration, or mq double dot, is equal to the forces being applied. Um, and this f, this might be something external, it might be gravitational force, whatever. We're not going to get into the details. Um, uh, we're going to say it's some force f. Um, and in fact, very soon we're going to assume that it's zero. That might seem a bit weird given for sure you have gravity, but we're just not going to worry about that. Um, it's very easy to include this. It'll just make the analysis more complicated. So we have this force push, pushing us down. Um, and then we also have two forces, one from the spring and one from the damper. And these are pushing us up. So we have a minus k Q force coming from our spring. If we make Q big, we'll get a, a, a tension pulling us back. And similarly from the damper, we have a force that's proportional to um, the velocity of the mass Q. And the damping coefficient C of Q depends um, on Q in this funny nonlinear way. And this is precisely the uh, equation that we saw in the very, the very first lecture. Um, but it's not in our uh, our so-called uh, non-linear form. So our first exercise is going to be to put it in that form and then we're going to investigate it a little bit. Um, so how can we put this in the form x dot is equal to f of x u, y is equal to g of x u. And now just like when you were studying linear systems, we have to use the same trick. So when we, whenever we have an equation with higher order derivatives in it, so derivatives of second order and above, we have to introduce extra states. And the rule is, um, if we have 
second order derivatives, we need first order derivatives in our state. If we have third order derivatives, we need second order in our state. And this will allow us to put things into our standard state space form. So we're going to say that our state vector is q dot q. So it consists of the position and of the velocity. And in our state space form, we know we need d by dt of this to equal some stuff. So what is that stuff? Well, we can't go directly from this equation here, but after a little bit of simplification, we can. So in particular, if we divide through by the mass, then we have a nice equation for q double dot, and so we can start to fill in this relationship here. So this is d by dt of q dot, so q double dot is equal to something. And what is that something? Well, we now just read straight from our equation. And so we have a minus k q, a minus c of q q dot. So let's just substitute in our relationship. So we have u q squared minus 1. Oh, I already forgot my m. So we divide through by m q dot. And then we also have a plus f over m. So that gives us an equation corresponding to this first row. How about to the second row? Well, this just says d by dt of q. So q dot is equal to some function of our state in our input. But q dot is in our state. So we just put it here. And so the important thing to note is that this is a function of our state, which in this case is q and q dot, so that's x, and our input, uh, which um, in this case is this externally applied force. So just by a little massaging we can put this higher order nonlinear differential equation into our standard form. Okay. Great. Uh, now what happens? So before we start um, plotting our limit cycles again, let's imagine a simple case, in which case mu is zero. So what does that mean? Well, if mu is zero, our damping coefficient is zero. Um, and in fact, we can see directly from this equation here, if we block out this, then we actually now have a linear equation. So this only depends linearly on q, the force enters linearly. So if the damping is zero, this system simplifies to a linear system. And more than that, if you think about what would happen if we started messing around with this system, you might start to think you're going to see a limit cycle behavior emerging. So let's uh, say we pull the mass down. If there's no damper here and we let go, what's going to happen? Well, this thing is just going to oscillate backwards and forwards forever with a fixed period and a fixed amplitude. So why is this not a limit cycle? Um, so let's just plot this out a little bit to see what's going on. So here we have time. Here we have Q. I, yeah, I forgot. We didn't bother to do an output equation. This could easily be done if we were interested in particular outputs. So let's just say because we're plot plotting Q here, we're interested in the particular output Q. So let's write down an output equation for that. And that's simply that y is equal to Q. And this is our g of xu. It's a function of our state and our input. So this is perfectly valid within the framework that we introduced last time. Detail. Back to the linear version. So this is under the condition that um, the damping coefficient is equal to zero, or really, I guess, mu, uh, mu is equal to zero. Um, and then we'll look at this particular initial condition cor corresponding to pulling down and letting go. So there, our initial condition is um, the velocity is zero, and the initial length of our spring is, uh, or the initial displacement of the mass is some distance, q0. And to keep things simple, we'll also say that our input is equal to zero. We said before, yeah, we would have gravity, so this is kind of nonsense, but in any case, the force would be constant, and it's very easy always to eliminate constant forces if you want. It'll just make things a bit messier. 
Okay, so we have this setup, and as we said before, in this setup, our nonlinear system actually collapses down to a linear system. And more than that, there is no damping, so that if we do stretch out our spring to a certain length and let go, um, then we'll start to oscillate and we get actually just this perfect cosine wave. So why is this not a limit cycle? Well, when we talked about limit cycles before, we said that the fundamental property of a limit cycle was that it settles into the same oscillation no matter where you start it, or it for some range of initial conditions it will settle into the same predictable oscillation. And that's what made it a useful thing for describing the behaviour of your heart, which is beating at this constant amplitude and uh, constant frequency. And this is where the linear system fails, because it's also easy to see but if we stretch it even further and let go, so we start from a different initial condition, say with Q0 twice as large, so say something up here, then it's going to oscillate, and it's going to oscillate with the same period, but now the amplitude is twice as large. So it's true that linear systems can have periodic solutions, but they can't have periodic solutions with fixed amplitude and period for a range of different initial conditions. And why is that? Well, we can see that directly from our property two. Um, so when we talked about the properties of linearity, property two uh, was that if we have a particular initial condition and a particular set of inputs, u1 of t, we have our system, we find it's, uh, we just compute our predictions um, by solving the nonlinear ODE or linear ODE uh, numerically or in the linear case through the formula. Um, so if our system is linear, given a particular initial condition and input, if we get this, uh, these outputs, then if we scale the initial condition and input, we get scaled versions of the outputs. So then, if we did the same thing but with in, uh, initial condition AX1 and input AX, uh, AU2, A, AU1, um, then we would get output AX of t and AY of t. And we, uh, we can fill in all the bits and pieces, but um, the point here is that um, now you can immediately see that we can't possibly get this limit cycle behavior. Because if we have one periodic solution to our system, then we could always create a new periodic solution with a different amplitude just by scaling the initial condition. So linear systems can have periodic solutions, but they can't have limit cycles. And this is not true of nonlinear systems. If you simulate um, this system, you get the limit cycle that we saw before. So if we do the same thing, um, so we draw T, we draw Q, we have the same initial condition and same input, but now we have mu is equal to one, then instead we do get this um, stable uh, periodic behavior. So given our initial condition, Q0. It slips into this sinusoid-like um, periodic solution, so it's not a pure sinusoid, it's sort of messed around a little bit in the peaks, but um, it's periodic, and no matter where we start, we settle into the same periodic solution, which critically has the same amplitude and the period is the same. So that's what a limit cycle is. Um, we've actually built a little MATLAB Simulink demo so that you can go and uh, build this system yourself and investigate its behavior for various different initial conditions. And I strongly encourage you to do this so that you can sort of get your hands on um, uh, to this sort of first uh, nonlinear limit cycling behavior.